see sort of the, the spectral images sort of bound back and uh, we go down and we clear past this wall and there's a body on the ground. From leading soldiers in Afghanistan to kicking down doors as part of the Ranger Regiment, Eric Wagi's career was marked by violence and close calls. He had the kinds of tours that can wear on your humanity if you take a moment to stop and think about it. But if you just keep running and fighting, you can avoid dealing with it for quite some time. The thing about leading, though, even in the United States Army, is that sometimes you have to negotiate. And when you do, you may want access to a little of that empathy you've worked so hard to keep buried. We start hearing chants down the bottom of the hill. And there's more and more of them coming. And it sounds like there's 500 dudes down there. My interpreter, he's very nervous. I say, hey, what are all these guys saying? He says, hey, man, these dudes are saying death to America. I could see the fear overwhelm them. What is true bravery? What makes a hero a hero? Tested by the worries of what's happening at home, thousands of miles away, and the reality of what you're facing here and now, when your life is in danger every second, and it's either kill or be killed. From Wondery and Incongruity Media, this is Anthony Russo, and this is war. Eric Wagi worked like hell to get into West Point, excelling in sports to sweeten his chances of acceptance and then doubling down on that effort after the towers fell in the beginning of his senior year. Iraq kicked off not long after, and the military college transformed during his five red-shirted years as the theoretical became practical. Combat veterans started returning to update the tactical curriculum with freshly learned experience garnered from fighting insurgents. But the curriculum wasn't the only thing that changed, as first alumni and then colleagues started dying. The first graduate who was killed, uh, I think she was an O2 grad, Laura Walker. It was sort of a big deal for the academy. You know, there's a moment of silence at lunch, you know, it's all 4,000 cadets eating lunch at the t- same time. And it was sort of impa- it was very impactful at the time. And the bagpipes came out at like 10 o'clock at night and we all turned off our lights and, and had candles. And they played um, Amazing Grace. And, you know, it's such a big deal. And that was just sort of the beginning. After that, over the four years, we stopped having these visuals for the most part. You know, there wasn't any big orchestrated mourning for them. You just sort of rolled with it. You and your peers and your friends sort of had to get used to uh, people dying pretty frequently that you're close to. Like a lot of infantrymen, Wagi played rugby at West Point. You get close to the other guys, literally and figuratively. So when they start deploying and dying while you're still in school, battlefield costs become much more real than in the classroom. But coming to terms with a career where your colleagues died regularly didn't so much dull his sense of loss as make it resolute in his mind. To think otherwise would be to miss the point of being a leader during wartime. People were going to die under his command. That often felt inevitable doing his best to restrict the number and the severity of casualties among his men and to take that responsibility seriously was the best he'd be able to do. I was in 132 Infantry. They had uh, just come off a deployment, a 15-month deployment. The senior NCOs, at least in my platoon, were not NCOs at the time when they were deployed. So sort of they had to grow up very fast. And the company commander had been killed the the last deployment. They had seen a lot of firefights. They had seen an immense amount of uh, violence. And they, they were some pretty hardened folks by the time I got there. And a lot of them were younger than me. <laughs> so uh, that was always a challenge. So I was sort of, you know, as a PL, I was itching to to get out and experience that. And it took some time. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't trying to, you know, chase folks down to get it done. I didn't want to put people at risk. But, uh, you know, I was really hoping for that to happen. Because, you know, there is some credibility that you get once you get your uh, combat infantry badge and whatnot. You know, it's a rite of passage. You've been tested and your medal's been tested. The mountains of Afghanistan were cold and quiet when he hit the ground with the 132nd at the end of 2008. Broadly speaking, the mission was to set up a forward operating base and use it as a springboard to train the Afghan National Army and police as it set trying to pacify the region. The hope had been to make the ANA the face of the mission, establishing it as the primary military force. We were up on this, uh, what it's called Con Hill. We're not sleeping that much because we're always pulling security, you know, again, f- just a few hours of sleep a night. And I just remember sleeping in my little sleeping bag every night, praying for the sun to come up to warm, warm us up. 
the sort of fucked up thing about this hill is that it was a cemetery all around it. An information operation standpoint, like a psychological op standpoint, this was probably the worst place to have this patrol base. This is pretty disrespectful in retrospect. And I get a call from my commander to go clear this route for uh, some future operations. So I had to leave a an element on top of this hill, about half my guys on the top of this hill with some heavy machine guns. And then I left with about 12 or 14 guys and a couple machine guns. We don't have any kind of technical equipment to clear this route for IEDs. We're doing it all visually. There's lots of irrigation systems, which sort of form these natural trenches. We're walking down this road. I hear pops. I hit the deck and I hear my saw gunner blazing at this trench. You know, <laughs> sort of fucked up, but I got a little bit of a grin because I'm like, it's on, man. I had this a AMP guy next to me. I mean, his rounds are coming right next to my guy's ear. So I, I jump on this dude and sort of wrestle him to the ground and tell him to shut the gun down because he's about to cause frat on my guys. We hop into the trench line. They essentially skirted out using these trench lines out to some dead space behind a, a wall and had hopped on motorcycles and just like got the hell out of there. And they just got away. So it was really sort of unclimactic, but it was my first real, real firefight. It certainly wasn't going to be his last. Setting aside the tensions that had been mounting between the Afghans and the U.S. troops since the invasion, Con Hill held a particular place in local lore. In the early 80s, not long after the Russian invasion, Soviet troops established a presence and, as the story was told to Wagi, arranged a meeting with 72 village leaders, people of influence in their social circles from teenagers to old men. The Soviets bound the men when they arrived and executed them in the half-built jail at the foot of the hill. The jail never was completed. The bullet hole riddled foundation served as temporary billeting for Wagi and his men as they established the base. Around the cemetery flew 72 green flags to memorialize the dead. This wasn't a place that treasured foreigners, and certainly not one where negotiating with foreign forces was considered wise or even useful. So as new faces started showing up in the village after that first firefight, tensions only could have heightened. After all, it already was a hill for spilling blood. I'm sleeping inside this little foundation. You know, we have five gun trucks circled around the top of this hill. And I start talking to dudes, I'm like, hey, uh, you know, we're getting some feedback from the locals that the Taliban have been um, essentially spraying graffiti all around the village. So I go and I link up with some uh, local police and get them to go on patrol with us to sort of to scrape off all this graffiti, this pro-Taliban graffiti. And then we hear the first pop and then a lot more pops. And then we see uh, this team of guys bound into this wall about 200 meters away and they start engaging us. And this is right at dusk, man. The sun is just going down the mountains. And then we start hearing pops from the bazaar, which is running perpendicular to the hill. And there's guys on top of these roofs on the bazaar who are engaging us. So now we're getting hit from two sides. And then we hear some pops from the other side down by the hill. And we see we start receiving some RPG rounds. This cloud cover starts coming in. And, you know, it's not too thick at this time. We I think there's probably like 30 dudes, a uh, platoon-sized element that was attacking us. At this point in time, I'm not too afraid because we do have a a shit ton of uh, ground-based fires. We're not necessarily in a bad situation. My guys in the gun position by this wall were using M14s, which are these uh, essentially just a rifle, to start popping these guys off on these roofs. And there's still this pocket of dudes who are who are getting uh, pretty good fires on us. And this is all happening in like 15 minutes. Wagi called for air support. Without a good sense of what was going on in the field, crossing all that dead space between them and the enemy stronghold was asking to get ambushed. Unfortunately, the cloud cover had continued to thicken and there was none available. This was a problem that he would have to solve by himself. Sometimes the enlisted like to joke about West Point officers, about their know-it-all attitude or the way they carry themselves. It's not much of a secret and something the officers get comfortable with as long as they're good at their jobs. Wagi was good at his job and he wasn't a know-it-all, which is why he went to his NCO for a plan. Because in the heat of battle, there's almost nothing more valuable than an NCO who knows his stuff. I go to this gun position. I have this very competent uh, NCO, Sergeant Camacho. I'm like, hey, man, we got to maneuver on these dudes right now. We got any recommendations? And he says, bust out of this foundation. And we go along this ridge line and we get sort of uh, parallel to this wall. We're going to be pretty exposed when we do this. And then we get enfilade fire and just like kill these dudes behind this wall. <laughs> it's sort of the scariest time because I can see the muzzle flashes of these AKs like 50 meters away from me. And I can see them popping off, pointing at my other guys up on top of the hill. If they just turn their hips around, and looked at me with their, their AKs, they could just gun us all down pretty easily. So we get there, and then uh, we all get set, and we start laying down just rifle fire 
on this wall. We see sort of the, these spectral images sort of bound back. We go down and we clear past this wall. There's a body on the ground. It's in a puddle. And all I can hear is the sound of a cell phone ringing. He's sort of like, I, I turn his body over and I look at him. He's got this sort of like uh, Mona Lisa smile staring up. His eyes are open. We caught him with some, probably like some 5.56 five, underneath his eye. Um, it didn't blow out the back of his head and it sort of got, must have rattled around up in his brain, but he was, uh, he was definitely dead. We clear it, try to find a gun. There is no gun there. So that's sort of concerning. We need some sort of evidence that we're in a firefight to a degree. And also we need, uh, you know, was this guy a civilian? Was he just in the wrong spot at the wrong time? But uh, right now the fog is starting to close in on us at this point in time. We throw this body and we put it in a Humvee and we drive it up the top of this hill. We're trying to see if this is, you know, he has a, this body is of an individual who was registered, but his hands are uh, stone cold by now. Riga Morris is saying it and he's starting to stiffen up. Most of my guys are trying to use MRE heaters to warm his hands up so we can see if we can pull his fingerprints. As that's going on, you know, telling my commander, he says, uh, hey, we're starting to get um, some uh, signal intelligence that there's a uh, element of about 40 dudes driving up from... Uh, from Chark to take revenge on the guys you killed tonight. So we're like, okay, we got 40 more guys coming to get us. Right when that happens, like we just get enveloped in this fog that's thick as pea soup. We can't see anything. My thermals aren't working through there. You, could, you couldn't see five feet in front of your face. So I just have our guys go to their fighting positions or gun positions and we just hold tight. We have no air support. Can't get anybody out if we get take casualties. You just can't see shit, man. Like everything's just closing in on you. We don't have any kind of uh, obstacles or barriers protecting us to prevent folks from coming up. For the next few hours, everyone's just on edge, like no one's sleeping. We're all getting ready for this node to get into some close combat. The dead man wasn't in the system. Whether he was an unlucky recruit or an innocent bystander was something Wagi and his platoon didn't know and wouldn't find out. What they did know was that the anger and the outrage over this man's death had swelled, and they wouldn't be fighting Taliban fighters, but rather angry locals. In the heat of recounting that story just now, Eric Wagi misspoke. There weren't 40 guys on the way to kill them. There were 400. Wagi was leading 25 or so members of the best equipped, best trained military forces in history. There was no question they had superior firepower and also the high ground. But there were no battlements. Not unless you count the turrets. No obstacles between the bottom of the hill and the top except the rounds the soldiers could unleash at thousands per second. With a numbers deficit of nearly 20 to 1, fear did start to creep in. This is what makes a leader keeping your guys cool before, during, and after the fight, making sure that passions don't create tactical errors with deadly consequences. Around four in the morning, right before the sun's showing up, we start hearing chants down the bottom of the hill, and there's more and more of them coming, and it sounds like there's 500 dudes down there. My interpreter, he's very nervous. to hey, what are all these guys saying? He says, hey man, these dudes are saying death to America. I could see the fear overwhelm them as he told me that. So I got like four or 500 dudes at the bottom of this hill and this, you know, pea soup thick fog. You know, people are starting, we're trying to keep our shit together at this point in time, trying to keep people calm over the radio. I mean, it's the, the team mentality that's going to get you through it. Let them know that we're all going to work together to get through this. And it's it just words of encouragement, honestly, in those situations. There's nothing like, there's no magical silver bullet that we could have done, I don't think, to, uh, to make this situation any easier. Just hold, hold the line. And, you know, it definitely was not me. This is, you know, the NCOs working together as a team to reassure everyone that we're going to make it through this. Getting ready to toss grenades out the turrets to try to clear any kind of uh, assault that gets close up to us. Because that, that'd be the problem is that they could get really close to us. So, right, you know, we're hearing these guys and then start seeing these bodies walking slowly up the uh, the dog legs of this trail up to the top of the mountain. And, uh, you know, they didn't seem threatening about four or five men, you know, they didn't look armed at all. One had a walking stick and that's about it. And then uh, this elder comes up to me and I'm with my interpreter, he says, there are 400 men down there that want to kill you. The fact that they were talking at all showed Wagi that they were open to negotiation. 
Through the interpreter, he tried to strike a conciliatory balance, emphasizing that they had been fired upon, reminding the old man that they both knew there were a number of Taliban getting shelter and aid in the village. And as subtly as he was able, Wagi impressed upon the elder that yes, there were just the 25 of them up there, but they were really, really well armed, and that even if they were overrun, certainly it wasn't something the rest of the army would let pass. The fog wouldn't hold forever. After like 30 minutes of negotiation, the village elders seemed satisfied and we eventually came to the conclusion that we call a local representative from uh, Kabul to come down and do an investigation. The, the thing that sort of fucked me up the most was, at the end of the day, I don't know if he was a good or bad guy, but uh, his body's up there on this hill. I remember the only thing we found on him was a cell phone and then he had like a turnip, which he was a snack. It was the brothers calling the man that was killed, uh, asking if he, he was okay. His brothers come up and they are looking at me with the most hatred I've ever experienced in my life. And they are screaming at me and telling me that I murdered his, their brother. It was just a very intense emotional situation talking to these guys because, you know, right or wrongly, we had just killed their brother. And he was a father of like, you know, six kids or whatnot. And so they gather his body up, they carry him down to the bottom of the hill. We still hear the chance of death to America down at the bottom. And then right when they get to the bottom of the hill, the sun finally completely breaks the mountains. And as the fog sort of dissipates across uh, the plain, we see the backs of 400 dudes walking back towards the village. And, you know, it's a sigh of relief. You know, we made it through the night. You know, we were so vulnerable. We had no support. It was all on us. It could have gone south real, real fast. And we probably would have all been killed ultimately. <laughs> um you know, we, we, we ended up getting some intelligence out. We, uh, we killed eight guys that night. They died in a local hospital after they, were, they had been brought from the battlefield to the hospital and they all died. The false accusation weighed on him, and it still does. The larger point the elder made, or at least the one Wagi took with him, was that part of the village's rage did have to do with the man being killed, sure. But the other part of it was fueled by the fact of the occupation itself. The Americans wouldn't have been fired upon if they weren't there. When there's that much anger and impotence, it is sure to boil over. Also, the tour would have to finish without him. Wagi was ordered to relieve another commander farther up the Kunar Valley. Before he left, he was able to negotiate an additional four hours per day worth of generator fuel for the village. It was something. At home, in between assignments, he got to learn what apps were, and then how to use them. Metaphorically, anyway. Come home to the... United States and like nothing's going on, man. You just, you know, people will give you a clap when you walk to the, uh, the airport. And I just, uh, just a huge disconnect. I remember uh, technology changed so fast at that point in time. Like when I left, you know, at the end of 2008, early 2009, people were talking about these things called smartphones or iPhones. And I come back a year later and everyone has these smartphones. They're, they're um, ubiquitous. And I felt like while I was gone, and I had just been living in a black hole for several months. Then, you know, me and my wife, we, we went down and visited my, my family in Tennessee and then visited some of her family. And it's sort of like you have this uh, war application in your brain and you have all, you know, you have all these applications, you have this empathy application, you have this war application, you have uh, all these apps. But uh, when you're overseas, you turn on your war app and then uh, you turn it off when you come home and I, you know, just turned the war app off when I got home. But sometimes, you know, I've found sometimes that the application is always just running in the background, especially these days. And you may not know it's there, but it's definitely running. Sometimes it, uh, it pops up. You sort of let it run. I try not to get too invested in it. You know, it's sort of, I don't know. Sometimes it's like a rotating door and you can't stop a lot of these uh, experiences from showing up but sometimes you can keep the door closed and you just do your best to try to keep that door closed. Heading back to the Kunar province, he switched his war app back on and set to his work. Back on Khan Hill, they would eventually establish and then demolish a more permanent base over the next decade or so. In Wagi's new role, he'd be an interim company commander, coming in as second in command just in time for the regular commander to rotate home. His tactical role would become bigger picture, but also way more personal. Fortress, the combat outpost to which he'd been assigned, was under constant harassment, and right from when he arrived, it was clear that there was no safe place in the compound. I got to this little shack, this little shed that had like two computers on it, you know, Skyping with the wife, checking up with her, and there's this kid next to me, he's probably like 19 years old, and he was Skyping with his family. 
And as I'm walking back to the office, we get hit. I ran to the command post. But I remember using this camera and I saw this four or five RPGs launch from this fine position because you could see them just sort of float through the air like 600 meters away and eventually like get closer and closer and closer. It's all just, it was just crazy in slow-mo. Uh, my butt puckered up because I knew these things were headed right towards us. And you just like, you, you tense up and you squeeze your body together and like, you just wait for the impact and just hope that another shrapnel gets you and you you feel the the wall shake and uh, you hear the impacts and whatnot. That was sort of common. <laughs> but the thing about this one was, I heard that we had taken a casualty. The firefight was peering out. We weren't taking as much fire. So I ran to the uh, the hut where this kid had been. There's blood all over the floor and he's laying out in the gravel. We got some eggs on and he's like screaming. He's holding his head, crying for his mom. And I go up to him. He's got this gash, probably about the size of a pinky parallel to his eyebrow. So I'm like, man, he must've caught some of that shrapnel, <clears throat> but he's crying and, you know, blood's pouring out. We call the Kazovac. You know, we had found out that the bullet had actually gone from the back of his head and burst out his forehead. We go back into this hooch where he had been sitting and I'd been sitting right next to him a couple minutes before. And there's this, this round lodged into the computer screen that he had been looking at. And the bullet had just like gone through the back of his head and gone out the, his forehead and lodged into the computer screen. He should have died. Like, I don't, I don't know. I, I saw a picture of him. Our uh, company commander went to go visit him after the deployment. The top of his skull had been removed. He had a lot of mental difficulties and was in constant pain. But, you know, this this dude was like 18 or 19 years old and, you know, he had to live with this for the rest of his life and his family had to live with this for the rest of his life. And it's, it's a shame, you know, and, and uh, after being there so long, sort of questioning sometimes, was the juice worth the squeeze from investing in, in this, this fight? And were we there for the right reasons? Yeah, that, that starts that, those kind of thoughts start lingering up on you. The regular company commander took it upon himself to visit that young man in the hospital stateside. In his absence, Wagi was acting company commander, handling the day-to-day -day tactics and administration. 19-year-old Brian Wolverton was killed by a mortar round not long after arriving at Fortress. It was to have been his first combat tour. His family was notified by the same knock at the door so many military families receive and all of them dread. As acting commander, personal condolences fell to Wagi. Of all of the duties he had to discharge during his career, this was among the hardest. I never knew him. He was assigned to our company. So I had to do the administrative actions also do the company morning. We had to do the ceremony and then uh, also, you know, call his mom. I got the, the phone the first time and uh, I had called her that, that day and I like, it took just so much courage and I tried calling her and she never picked up. And I was so thankful that, that she did not pick up. I was so thankful. And then, you know, I felt an obligation to try again. So, you know, a day or two later, I try again and uh, she picked up. And I felt like I was going to puke um, talking to her because it was sort of a, you know, sort of, in a sort of a cold call, I guess, you know, I started talking about her son, you know, she started crying immediately. It was just, again, it was just very painful. Like just a new guy comes on board and is immediately killed or wounded. You know, the culmination of his life and that little section of the Hindu Kush, it wasn't that dramatic. And that's sort of a shame. We're, we're wasting these young lives. For these mountains, and it may not it may not be worth it. It had been fewer than five years since West Point all but stopped when Laura Walker was killed in action. Before he left school, Wagi had resigned himself to the truth that violent death was not only inevitable during war, but eventually numbing as well. When he'd arrived the previous winter, he marveled at how cheap and brutish life in Afghanistan was, but then he got a taste of the violence they lived with. Wolverton died in August 2009, a particularly violent month in a particularly violent year. Wagi had six months left on his first tour. They would be difficult ones, punctuated by deaths, close calls, and injuries that would follow him through the rest of his time as an officer. There's this patrol towards, I guess, the end of the deployment. They've been driving uh, over on the route next to us, and they got hit by uh, a near ambush. It was an RPG-6 or 7, I think, and these things are... Uh, Armor piercing, they create this sort of bolt-in bolt that shoots through the armor of a vehicle, bounces around inside, and this kid, uh, I think he was Kirkpatrick, he wasn't assigned to my unit, but they had gotten hit right next to us. He had been injured, and they had brought him into the cop. They're all stunned, and the leader of this unit was like, he had his no uh, saving private riot moment, where he was just sort of, I don't know, comatose, <laughs> just like staring off into the distance, and he wasn't really helping too much. So I go to pull this kid out of the vehicle. I grabbed onto his legs 
when I grabbed onto his legs to pull him out, his legs came off. And I remember looking down at the legs. And I know if you look at like a, you ever do ribs in like a slow cooker, you can sort of see the bone on the edge of the meat sort of sticking out. I remember looking down like sort of seeing that when I pulled his legs out. So I fell down on the ground. I'm like, holy shit. Then I go and I pull from his hips and try to like cradle his legs, which are still serving sort of the sleeves of his pants on my shoulders to pull him out of the vehicle. And we put him on the stretcher and we get him into the, uh, the, our medical building. He's all pasty pale and the sweat's coming off him, but he's smiling because he's just drugged up and he's trying to be a hard ass. And I, I see him like, like he's dying in front of me. And, uh, the blood's just pouring out like a faucet. We do another tourniquet on his leg to try to get a second one on there to staunch the blood. I guess his left leg had been blown off completely. And his right leg had a piece of like sinew that kept it attached. And, uh, dude, I don't know how this guy survived. It was like, uh, I mean, any other war, you know, a decade earlier or beyond, well, he would have definitely been toast. But, uh, he made it, man. We, we evacuated him on the aircraft and, uh, he lost both his legs and whatnot. But, uh, he survived. That sort of was like, shit like that just kept coming, man. Doubt can start to undermine your resolve, which makes everything a little bit more dangerous for everyone. Though he wasn't registering it fully at the time, as his tour wore on, Wagi was burying whatever doubts he had and using them as fuel to keep on moving. For him, it wasn't so much the danger as it was the responsibility. Wagi was comfortable with his own performance and putting his own life on the line, but watching comrades and civilians alike lose their lives without a clear view of completing an objective eventually would take its toll. By the time he was done with the first tour, Wagi knew he needed a different kind of day-to-day even if it was a little bit more dangerous. It had been the kind of deployment that often can be a soldier's last. Wagi had done his combat tour, taken command, and seen as much as he needed to see of the day-to-day of the War on Terror. But he didn't want out. In fact, he was home for a total of five months before he redeployed. He spent three of them getting into the Ranger Regiment. For contrast, most officers do two in the regiment, rotate out, and then go back. Directly after his first tour, Eric Wagi spent the next five years on constant rotation between deployments with the regiment and training. So a lot of the ranger stuff, I honestly don't feel too comfortable talking about because they're still uh, heavily involved in that region of the world. The ranger regiment is, uh, they have a lot of assets, the most competent enlisted soldiers that I've ever met or interacted with. But yeah, the main job that they do is to kill people. They don't go out and conduct counterinsurgency. They go out and they hunt folks down for the most part. And uh, they're really good at it. But with that, you know, every organization has its flaws. Regiment, again, have, for all its competence, it does have some some issues that are just sort of associated with their line of work. In the military, it was the funnest time I've ever had working with them because of their mission set and just the kind of people I was working with. I, I was pretty, you know, I was probably above average in the uh, 10th Mountain Division as an officer. And then I came to Ranger Regiment, I was probably, you know, mediocre <laughs> at best with the quality of individuals I was working with. You, you hear it say a lot, they're, they're, they're a national treasure based off the institutional the knowledge they have at the in the line of work that they do. In retrospect, I probably should not have deployed with them as soon as I got back from that first year of Afghanistan because I don't think I was emotionally prepared to go into that line of work so quickly. And I haven't been able to process everything I had experienced that first year. Of course, Wagi didn't have to resign. He could have taken some time away as many officers do, but that wasn't the point. For him, especially given the difference between his 15-month regular army combat deployment and his five years kicking indoors with the Rangers, there was no going back. Besides, he knew he owed his wife. And, in some ways, he owed his father, too. I had twin boys (laughs) after my, like, second or third deployment. You know, I talk to my wife every day, and she's crying every single day. You know, in regiment, we do a lot of training and traveling, so I'm gone most of the time. It definitely caused a lot of grief my family at that point in time. My father made a lot of career decisions based off wanting to be a present father and a present husband for our family. And uh, I wasn't doing that for five years, definitely not for five years. 
you know, just seeing her cry so much and seeing the, you know, my children look at me like, who's this guy? Just sort of, you know, it's not the father I wanted to be, and the husband I wanted to be. Except for the multiple and emphatic attempts to get him to stay on in some capacity, the transition out was simple enough. The tough part for him, though, has been making it in the civilian world, relating to people, trying to take first world problems seriously when that war app of his is still running in the background while the other apps are slow to boot up. You know, the, the people I work with are very driven. The, the only thing is that culturally this organization relies heavily on empathy, working with your subordinates and with your coworkers. That's sort of the hardest thing because I, I have had to, that empathy app I talked about earlier, that thing has not been running for a long time. So <laughs> I've been, I had to turn that on recently and it's, uh, it drains the battery. <laughs> I get pretty tired uh, trying to be empathetic all the time. I, I think I was pretty empathetic before I joined the, the army and then even before I went to combat, but now it's sort of, it's challenging to get it back. Empathy is a thing made up of layers. You start by recognizing another creature, then another human being, then a person with wants and needs. No one can endure a half dozen years of witnessing extreme violence and receiving and inflicting pain at every turn if they contemplate how everyone involved is feeling. It's not just impractical, but it's psychologically impossible. The best you can do is look around at your family and into the mirror and see creatures, then humans, then persons, and resolve to work to be the kind of guy who cares about those kinds of things. Next time on This Is War. Tried to pull the gun away from him, but he had it slung around his neck. I had my tomahawk just hanging around my waist, and so I grabbed that and used that against him. Are you a combat veteran, or do you know one with a story to tell? Reach out to us at stories at thisiswar.com with your dates and branch of service, as well as a brief description of the experience that you would like to share. If you like the show, you can help support us by visiting our sponsors or by leaving a five-star review wherever you're listening right now. This Is War was written by me, Anthony Russo, and produced by Incongruity Media. Executive producer, Hernan Lopez for Wondery. 